This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And we've got a great guest today. This is actually his first time on the Power Producers, but the second time that I've had the pleasure of interviewing him. And that is Philippe Charles Pierre from Semzi. And we're going to get into all the cool stuff Semzi does and how much it's changed since our first conversation. But before we get into that, let's, we were, he was just starting to give a little bit of a recap on um, InsureTech Connect, and I wanted to make sure I hit the button. So talk a little bit about what it was like out at ITC coming back and getting back into the groove today. Yeah, no, ITC was really great. It, it, it was great. Uh, obviously tiring. Uh, a lot of people there. Um, not as many people, to be frank, as I expected, but it, it was also more spread out. So that really helped uh, in, in many ways. And, and for us, it was about three things. Meeting our carrier partners who really wanted to meet with us uh, and talk about uh, our strategy, talk about their strategy and how we can work together. Secondarily, meeting with some of our partners um, who use the technology, uh, especially our larger partners, uh, including the folks at Heffernan. Um, we saw they announced a, a partnership with them about two or three weeks ago. And then I'm always looking for who are the next, let's call it two or three interesting Heffernan-like partners. And I would say that there's about three or five of them who came to us and said, hey, here's what we're looking to do. I understand this is what SEMC does. Can you help me with X, Y, or Z? And, and that was really, really fun to see. And I think, I, I have to say, I think that I'm really proud of our team. And, you know, we've been at this for six years. And I think we've gotten a really good reputation in the marketplace where come, people come to us and say, is this something you can actually help us with? And, and sometimes it's no. And, and sometimes it's yes. Yes, it's funny to me, man, because I can't imagine what it's like if you've built something, developed it, turned it into what it is, all those blood, sweat, and tears. And then somebody comes up to you and says, I know what you do, but could you make it do this for me? You know, right. I mean, that's the other way of looking at it. But you've changed a lot, man. I mean, I know that I, I've even seen Semzi at this point. My good friend, John Mason at Shenango Brokers is using yeah. you on, on his website as a value add to the agents that are going to Shenango to place business, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, when you're talking about looking for those big relationships uh, in the fact that there were, you know, four or five of them out at ITC, what's driving that? What, I mean, what, what yeah. drives the bigger relationship versus, yeah, you know, I, I feel like a smaller agency, it makes sense. A lot of sense because we only have so many hours in the day, right. a lot of the bigger agencies, not that it doesn't make sense there, but, it's like trying to turn a cruise ship on a 180, you know what I mean? No, on a dime. It's it, it, it's, a, it's a lot to navigate. So what, what drives that, that they're, they're reaching out? Absolutely. To your point on the smaller agencies, look, a person could come onto their web, uh, come to our portal. They can quote four lines of business. Most people are quoting three to four lines of business and three to four carriers per line of business and get it all done in 20 minutes. Right. Send, submit to all those carriers and all those lines, get it back, figure out which one's the best one for their customer and go out and sell it. But that's a very different, but yet there are some similarities with the larger partners. What the larger partners are interested in is technology to help them do a couple of things. One, make the life of their agency base easier and better. Two, these partners are often create, oftentimes creating programs or relationships with carriers or MGAs or what have you. They, they want to coalesce into one technology in one place. And that's what we offer. 
And then the third piece of that is we can also offer these agencies uh, and these partners a app, app, app action, or uh, we can offer them markets as a last resort if they themselves don't have a particular market. And what I think I find even more exhilarating is every time an agency partner or a large partner comes to SEMC, we're also still introducing them to other markets. So it's not like we're being greedy. And that really shows that what we've built has become and is becoming a real good hub of activity for commercial insurance, especially for small commercial. Yeah, you know, I think the other thing too, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, but but I think about this a lot. You know, there are a lot of people out there that just simply want to go to the website and get an indication or a quote. They don't want to talk to me. They don't want to talk to my team. They just, they want to go on and, and, and do it and be done with it. And an agency that doesn't have the ability for somebody to at least start a quote on their website, even though we all know we have to talk to them to get things finalized. Okay. You know, I feel like the agency that doesn't even have that starting point is missing out on just pure gold in terms of data, right? Because you get people that go in, start quotes on a website, that information can be put into your CRM for remarketing down the road or whatever else. But in the meantime, if you don't have anything, that's an opportunity to get that person's information that could lead to a future sale that you're simply going to miss because you don't have the tool there. That's exactly right. So with our tool and, and tools just like it, it's two things. One, to your point, how do I help engage my leads without me? Or how do I help engage my leads or my customers with me, but not necessarily where they have to talk to me every day, all day long? Right. And then how does that then create data that allows me to either get them the, what they need business wise? And you do a great job of giving people really great advice on how to sell workers comp and such and what questions to ask right so how do you do that and then also how do you leverage the technology to gather the data to figure out where's the market going where wh where do i need more access to markets because somebody's leaving the market or hey i didn't realize these types of businesses are starting to pop up where i'm from i need to get a market that can be helpful like you know cannabis is big in certain areas we just added blitz Right. And now for agents who are getting that, they've got an option. So that's absolutely right. The data, the data matters a lot, even for carriers and MGAs, the data that we have and that we can work with them on, even if they don't win the business, they can learn from it. Is it because of my coverage? Is it my price? Is it the combination of the two? And it usually is. Um, and so even in not winning the business, you have data to win it either going forward or figure out how to maneuver and or alter your strategy to win the next time. Well, I think the other thing too is we're in the hard market. That's not a secret. Everybody knows it at this point. And as a result of the factors of being in a hard market, a lot more people are shopping. You know, everybody wants to find out how they can save money. And I look at this from a different, a little bit different point of view in that it's honestly helping me call all the people out that weren't going to buy value to begin with. They're just looking for the cheapest price they can possibly buy. I don't want to have to pay a human being to do that for me. If, if I can do the same thing with a, a tool that is going to give them what they want or disqualify them from being somebody we would That's normally right. do business with. Right. And so I think that, you know, right now, so many agencies out there, you know, look, we're in this industry, Yes, we can all make really good money making it, but most agents, if not the overwhelming majority that I talk with, tell me the same thing, and that is they're in this industry because they like to help people. And that's really what who we are at our core. It's why we're involved in our communities. It's why we volunteer and do the things we do. And so it's very difficult when you have somebody who's getting financial pressure in the form of increased premium, if they reach out to you for you to say, no, I'm sorry, you don't fit in the box of people we want to write, right? That's right. So that actually avoids the uncomfortable conversation That's you know, right. because we, we can't deviate. Like I'm only good at what I'm good at. I can't be all things to all people and I don't want to try to be. And so I do think that if you have it, have it at a point where people can go in and, you know, I look at it this way, it's a hundred percent of the business. I probably wouldn't have prospected to begin with. So if we can develop, begin the sales process 
and get far enough down the road that it makes sense. And it looks like this is an account that we would work with. We would represent, even if it doesn't meet premium threshold, which I'll tell you, man, I've seen half million dollar accounts shopping online. So it's not like yeah. it's all small business either, but you know, if it doesn't meet our minimum premium threshold or whatever, we can push it into small business and let it grow from there or whatever else. But I, I think it's interesting because that's one thing that a lot of us aren't good at. We're not good at saying no, we're not good at purifying our yeah. funnel we just let anything and everything go in there and we sort of sort it out through the process as opposed to only putting the good in. You can do that when you're one-on-one -on -one having conversations, intentionally cold calling, prospecting and everything right. else. You can't do that with inbound. That's right. And, and David, correct me if I'm wrong, with this market as an agent who's trying to help, it's even more confusing as to where to place business because not because you don't know what you're doing, not because you don't understand the industry, but because carriers are changing. Their changes every day. Product. It changes every day. And so this is where technology more and more becomes a source of help more than it is anything else, right? We want to make it easy for that. For, just as you talked about technology helping the consumer. And we see that in the travel space, right? We see that in dating. We see that in all aspects of life where technology is giving the consumer more options quicker. Technology also does the same for the agent, right? If you're trying to help the customer, what technology can do is say, who's in market today? Who's got the right appetite for that risk? And give me a sense of what the pricing is so I can offer the options that me as the agent, one who wants to help that small business owner, whether it's an auto body shop, an old yoga studio, that restaurant, we want to give them the best value possible. Absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about the pivot, because when we originally had the, the first conversation um, on Agency Nation's podcast, the whole access to markets thing wasn't even on the table. So what brought that about and what made, what made, the, why did that make sense to you? Yeah, good question. So, you know, some would argue it's a pivot, some would argue it's an, as the natural evolution. As we were growing and we've got a few thousand agencies on our platform now and over 50 carriers, as we were growing, both agencies and our carrier partners were saying, hey, as a carrier or as an MGA, can you help me with distribution? I'm new to the market. I've got a real great product. While on the other hand, agents were saying, hey, Samsi, I noticed that you, you've partnered with carrier A, B, and C. I don't have an appointment with them. I know they're really good. Every once in a while, I need access to them. Can you provide that? And what we realized is there was a play there for us to be this hub between the carriers and between the agency. Uh, and so that, you know, really made us think about hiring, uh, getting the right licensing, but then also doing what SEMC does, which is to add really good technology, both in the front and in the back to make that hub really work well for both the agent uh, and, and the carriers. And so that's how it really got there. You know, as more and more agents were using our platform, as more and more carriers were on our platform, they were realizing that they weren't always connected to each other and they were both on our platform. So why not become, uh, again, that connector or essentially that hub of, of uh, between the agent uh, or the agents, pardon me, large and small, and, and these carriers. And in particular for carriers that are not always as well known, right? Obviously people use us to get to the large national carriers, uh, but more and more they need the regionals, more and more they need the specialty, more and more they need the niche. That's where it gets really hard, right? We think of Amazon, for example, as a place that gives a lot of options to consumers. Well, on some level, what's, what we at SMC want to be is kind of like Amazon, but for the agent, so that the agent can spend the less amount of, least amount of time trying to figure out who's got appetite and pricing so that they can be what they want to be, which is that service-oriented uh, you know, person in their community with the small businesses so that they can thrive. Yeah, and I think it's it's obviously a natural progression to move in that direction because if you're not able, I mean... There are so many people that are coming from the captive side. Let's just start there, right? right? They're coming from State Farm. They're coming from Allstate, Farmers, wherever. And it is not the easiest time for you to be able to go and get an appointment with a carrier, right? right. 
it's also not necessarily a shoe in you're going to be able to go to a preferred aggregator either. So, yeah. you know, the fact that there are other ways to get access to markets that will allow you to begin your, your to grow your business and scale it without selling your soul is huge. Right. And that's you know, exactly I th- right. And, and I, I think, think by the way, this is why some of those aggregators, networks, even wholesalers are also partnering with us because they want to add technology to their offering so that when I say hub, we don't necessarily have to always be the ones placing the risk or being there, right? We want to be the hub for all of that activity. So if you as an agent have a relationship with a Renaissance or, if, you know, Marshberry First Choice or a Shenango, as you mentioned, and others, we still want to be that hub. And then we can offer markets of last resort in many ways. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the adoption rate look like on that? Do you see that people are actually taking advantage of that since you've you've opened absolutely. it up and provided market access? Because it, I mean, I don't know what the timeline on it was, but I mean, it's been within like the last 12 to 18 months, right? Yes, it's been since the last actually 12 months. Uh, and what we're seeing in particular with some of our partners is that about 50% of the applications or the submissions that are going through SEMSI from these a- agencies are going to their appointed markets or our partners' markets. And then a little less than about 40% are going to markets they don't have access in either case, right? Now, it doesn't mean they bind that 40% or that 60%, right? They still have to figure out which one's the best market for their customer. But we're seeing a healthy percentage of the submissions are submissions to markets that we're providing in addition to the markets that agent has direct access to or accessing through a Shenango. So I'm going to ask you a question. I promise you, man, I'm not setting you up. So please don't think that. But I, I, I always end up when when I talk with guys like you, I always end up with brainstorming things in my head as we're talking. So one of the things I'm thinking to myself is how awesome would it be if I were an agency principal and I am using Semzi, but I'm using it through a third party, not necessarily directly in my agency, or I could even be using it directly in my agency. I don't know that it matters, but um, how awesome would it be if at the end of every month, I got a report as far as my production and distribution, uh, like we do from a regular carrier. So that, for example, if CNA is somebody on your platform, I don't know if they're on your platform or not, but if CNA is on your platform and I don't have CNA, but I see a trend that I'm binding a bunch of CNA business through Semzi. I feel like if I've got a little bit of ammunition, I can go to CNA and say, Hey guys, look, I'm already proven myself with That's you. Right. You know, what can we do to talk about me getting a direct appointment? And I understand that that may have an effect on ultimately monetization for Semzi. If, if you're able to share in that revenue or whatever else, but in a time where it's really, really hard, for people to get markets, a lot of the time we just sit back and complain about it. This is an yeah. actually a very viable solution for somebody who needs needs other markets to flesh out their offerings in their agency to write business before they have a volume commitment that they're going to get right. held to. I will do one better than that. It's a great question. It makes perfect sense. We actually introduce those agents to the market. And on top of that, there are some of the markets we work with who will do real-time appointments through SEMSI. Wow. And so that's why for us, it's about being the hub. And the hub simply means I am the connection and we are the connection between the agent and their needs and the market. And again, we don't care if it's direct appointed, inherited as we call it from a partner like a Shenango or if it's through SEMSI. Uh, but to your point, we we work with every we we do it all the time. Where we introduce a high performing agent with a for a particular market to that market, right? By the way, in the other side of it is also true. Carriers are also using SEMC to help reach agents who are low performing because we're a much more efficient way to communicate, interact with them, and try to drive up their share of wallet than the than the agencies who are already high performers. And so it can also work in the reverse. And that's what technology is for, in my view, and being the hub is about, is that connection on whether that means you want to increase share of wallet, uh, because 
you know, somebody's not performing as much as they could if they're not sending you all the business they could, or increasing share while because they, oh well, that that's a high performing, uh, you know, Florida Risk Partners does a killer job, and I don't have and they're, they're not appointed with me. Let me let me talk to Semsi. Semsi does the introduction. Boom, they're appointed with me. Everybody's happy. So it's funny, man, because I remember very vividly the first time we chatted, and one of the questions I asked you was, do you think that you will ever have a client-facing widget that can be put on somebody's website? That's how long ago that was. You didn't even have it yet. And you 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 were an internal tool that agencies were using just to simply try and get multiple quotes faster to slow to, to speed up how quickly they could turn things around. And now you're you're essentially building an entire new business ecosystem to generate revenue for these agencies. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's one other thing we did add to your point. Uh, it's been a little less than a year. Uh, we have an intake form that any agency can, with a they click a button on our platform and they it's white labeled or co-branded for them, branded to them. They can email it to a client, they can put it on their website and it feeds directly into SEMC for that agent to work that risk and, and get and get the quotes. And so, you know, we, again, we don't help, the, we don't go out and get leads for the, for the agents. Uh, but we 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 want to give them as many tools to do that. The thing that's even more powerful, and, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, David, is that that tool gets also used by a lot of agents who need to do book rolls and book shaping. Or hey, I just got uh, I just lost a market who's leaving a particular state or a particular line of business or a particular class code. Hey, let me send SEMC 500 risks from this class code, and then we will, in an automated way, go out and get you from your appointed carriers, we'll get you uh, markets and we'll get you pricing so that you don't have to spend, you don't have to work each individual risk. Uh, and that's, again, leveraging that intake form. So really leveraging what we have built to be as multifaceted uh, to help the agent as possible. So let me re- I'm going to restate what I think I heard you say to make sure that I'm 100% clear because I know the technology exists to be able to do this. So I, it, it'll be surprising if if it's not what I heard. But what I'm hearing is if we have a, an Excel spreadsheet or template that's mapped the data correctly to what your form would normally populate it, we could flip you over as many as 500 leads or more. At one time, you can upload that into your system and it's going to do its thing. That's exactly right. And and by the way, the, the what you need are less than five things, less than 10 things, pardon me, in order for us to flip that for you. You don't need everything and anything and everything because we know that gets hard to pull out of an AMS or CRM. Um, but that's exactly right. That's insane, man. So why wouldn't an agent use it? What are the objections you hear from people? Let's 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 hit that first, and then I want to hear yeah. some success stories because we're going to expel the ex objections right out of the box. Absolutely. The, the biggest objection we get isn't an objection to the concept, it's I can't access that data, which is mind blowing because it's their data. And I think, and it depends on the AMS they use, they can make it easier or hard for them to, act, to access it. Most agents don't have a data warehouse or a data lake where they house some of that data to make it easier to access and then to be able to implement it, right? Because we're really much more of an execution layer than anything else as this hub. Uh, so that's objection number one. Uh, objection number two would be, oh, I have some of the data, but guess what? I don't have the class code or the description for the business. Well, you kind of need that in order to, and and but we who's going to quote that anywhere else without you exactly. having that information? And so th that's exactly right. And so I've been shocked at sort of that level of of. of information being missed. And to that end, we are working with third-party data providers to help supplement that to make the life of the agent easier. Um, and then at, and then the other thing is they want us to limit it to like, oh, only go to this with these one or two markets. Well, if we're doing the work, we might as well not go to every market, but let's go to three to five because invariably, even if a market you think is going to work, they're not going to take all 500, right? Because for whatever reason, so why not? offer the opportunity to go to three to four of the markets that you wanted or you need to then make the right choice about, okay, for these 200, I'm gonna to go to this market, for these 100, I'm gonna go to that, and, and then be able to work that way. So those are some of the objections that we get. It's really less about the concept objection, more so than what do I need to give you SEMC to be able to then do it? And then maybe the last one I would argue is People haven't done a lot of this before. 
So it sounds more painful than it really is. Um, I, and, and I think, dude, I don't know what's painful about exporting data to a spreadsheet, emailing it to somebody and then letting them. You would be surprised. You would be surprised. Yeah, I wouldn't. I know my peer group, man. It's why I can make money. Right. And I think, if, but, and there are though, there is, there are agencies that, that on a monthly basis are sending us hundreds, if not thousands of leads a month for us to get them market, for them to shop it to back to their customer because they have to, right? You're not going to make more money when you have to shop a, a lead or shop a risk that you are, that's already in your books. So why not make it much easier and much faster? Agreed. So what's on the horizon, man? What do you, I mean, what are you comfortable letting us know you think you may be doing down the, down the road? Cause there's, so I mean, I, I know you're, you're not done. Yeah. Oh, we're definitely not done. We're just getting started. Right. That's, that's what's exciting about this six years in and we're just getting started. Um, there are a couple more partnerships that are coming that we're very excited about. Uh, folks who are going to be leveraging our technology to build their own their own tools. We're we're going to be working with carriers in very innovative ways, where carriers are going to be using our technology, in particular MGAs and newer carriers who don't have uh, portals where they could leverage SEMC in a white label way to do so. Um, we the third thing that I would argue is. We have built a really great tool and this hub. And for this market access piece that we're building, we're going to digitize the heck out of it. And we're going to make it that much easier. We want to be the best way for anybody and everybody to quote small commercial insurance uh, and to send it to the right markets and to, and to bind it. And so we're going to be doing a lot of exciting things on the front end to make it easier for the agent to quote for the agent to bind, and then for the agent to service. Um, and so that that's really what I'm excited about as we move forward. What about integrations, man, with agency management systems and things like that? You know, we haven't talked about that yet. And I know that that's one thing that people are always concerned about. I don't view yes. SEMSI as a rater per se. I, I view that it has a, a rater that's a component of it, but it's Correct. certainly not a be all end all. What does that look like? Are there seamless integrations with AMSs right now that people could literally just immediately like turnkey quote renewals from what they have in, in terms of their yeah. system? There are with some, you know, there's some of the, like a Hawksoft that we work with, you know, we're they're the best, with, obviously. Yeah. Right? I'd like to go on record and state that Hawksoft is the best. They're even, even regardless of technology, they're just the best people, man. Paul yeah, Hawkins has a great... Work. It built a great family. Anyhow, all of that being said, if you're not on the Hawksoft, I'm sorry. I'll have to apologize for you. But <laughs> That's right. Keep going. And and then, but if you are listening and you're on one of the, let's call it the big two, they have not made it easy for us yet. Um, and you could, you know, figure out why. Um, but there are ways around that. There are things that you as an agent can do uh, where you're not dependent on it. The world that I see, David, and for anybody listening is this. You shouldn't be dependent on SEMC but you also shouldn't be dependent on an AMS or a particular CRM. You should own your data. And when you own your data, that means you're building maybe a data warehouse or a data lake or some kind of structure that's independent from any of these tools where we can all hook into to be able to then help you execute your vision as an agent. Uh, and so where we're having a lot of success are these agencies, many of them are large, some of them are medium sized, and a few of them are small, where they've understood that. And then it allows us to then connect to their data warehouse, where they actually have fuller data that can then pre populate into SEMC. And guess what? Every time they use SEMC, we're, we're generating more data that feed that we then feed right back into their data house and data warehouse. They, and they, they like part of it. And that's really where we're seeing the winning. We're not seeing a lot of the winning, frankly. And it's a sore, it's a source of big frustration, I will be honest, uh, especially with the, the big, the big two. Um, but I think people are learning to get around that. And at some point, the door is gonna have to be open. You're gonna need, you know, in order for them, I think, to continue to grow. So here's the thing, man. I can say whatever I want because I don't have sponsors on this podcast, yeah. and I'm not speaking on behalf of Philip when I say this. But here, here's, this is an actual conversation that I had with the CEO of one of the larger insurtechs out there. Um, he informed me that the industry is consolidating and that 
everything is going to be vertical and there aren't going to be as many players and that's how it's designed. And if, you know, basically tough, if you don't like that tough, that's where the industry's headed. I very directly reminded him that we are all independent for a reason. And if we don't have choice, we will end up going and creating that choice as opposed to conforming to what the industry is trying to dictate to us. And I wasn't saying it to be a jerk. I just think this person had absolutely missed the mark as to who their constituency is. We, not every software provider for the insurance industry has every single box checked as best in class. I I don't mind calling names. Applied has great products. They have products that aren't as good. Same thing with Vertifor. Same thing with pretty much anybody else out there. This isn't about me throwing stones at any of them. They all have things they're really, really good at, and they all have things they can improve on, just like everybody else out there. The one thing that will be the, the absolute downfall of any of these larger companies achieving their total possible potential is when they try and dictate and limit. We're just not going to do well with that, man. We are Mavericks, right? And if we weren't, it would be a whole lot easier for me to go work for a captive carrier and just sell all day. I would have no problem. It's my favorite part of the job. And that doesn't leave with me when I go home every night. No, I want to be an independent agency owner. I want to produce in an independent agency. And that means I should have choices as a result of that. And I think that that's one thing that I think falls on deaf ears. And it's one re I mean, I would love to be out at, you know, in SureTech connect and all of those places, but, I got an agency to run here, man, you know, and, and until I get to a point where I feel like we're being heard and not just being charged, what's the point? I, I, I I couldn't have said it better myself and you've got a much better perspective on it than I, the perspective that I will share with you is as I talk to agencies, especially the large ones, they want that freedom. And it's why they're building these data lakes and data warehouses so that they can control the data and then everything else is just about plug and play. Well, I view that as what, so when I first got promoted, um, way back when, when I was running grocery stores, before I ever got into the insurance industry, the piece of advice that the retail operations superintendent gave me that gave that, that allowed me the opportunity to run my first store was, don't ever allow it to become big me, little you, when you're dealing with other people. He said, you got to be right on the same level with them. You got it. You've got to look them in the eye. You can't make yourself, you know, look more important because you'll alienate the people that you need to work with you and, and for you. And that's outstanding advice because that's a lot of what we see in our industry is big, me, little you. You see it at the agency side. You see it in the acquisition side. You see it in insure tech to a certain degree. And that's just, that's not going to fly in, in the, the reality in all of this is that the insurance industry, while it has moved slowly for a number of years, it is not moving slowly right now. We still might not be keeping up with a lot of other areas of technology, but we are moving at a light speed pace compared to where we were even 10 years ago. How I took that comment when I, when I was lectured and talked to like an elementary school kid about what I needed to know about how the insurance industry works was you're not smart enough to figure this out. You're not resourceful enough to go out and figure out a different way. And I'm the type of person who takes that as motivation. That is just jet fuel yeah. in the engine for me because you can take it to the bank. I will find another way to solve the problem Absolutely. at this point. And, and I think that's where a lot of it is. The other thing is mm. we have become far more open to outsourcing things. Yes. You know, you see way more virtual professionals being used in agencies today than ever before. And I would argue that up until probably three or four years ago, even there was probably, there was a, a, an unseen bias of people who just weren't willing to go down that road. They, whether it would be cultural differences or lack of trust or the fact that it wasn't somebody who was physically sitting, look, I've got offices all the way down that hall. I don't know what they're doing if I'm not standing in their office. So what's it matter if they're there or if they're on the other side of the world, either way, my involvement is going to be exactly the same, but it's opened our eyes and it's given us a broader mind. And it's also created a network with people in other parts of the world 
that have skill sets that can solve these problems for us. And, you know, we're getting really, really close. Like I can tell you right now, one of the trends that I've seen, and I'd be interested if you've seen this as well, but one of the trends that I've seen my agency friends that are smart enough to look for other options is robotic process automation. I see a lot of needs that are not being met by any of the, um, agency management system people, commission reconciliation is a great one. I've talked with three different companies in the last month that all have RPA for commissions reconciliation because the product that's out there right now isn't good enough. But if you look at life sciences, if you look at medical devices and uh, and pharmaceuticals, that whole industry changed a long time ago. It used to be they would have these massive R&D labs where people would come in and they would try and invent the next great product. How many really great novel drugs is one scientist going to invent in their lifetime? Two, if they're a unicorn, one, if they're lucky, right? Right. And so instead of spending all this money and having all this overhead, why not promote the free market economy and free thinking of people who can go out, do the fundraising, do all the legwork, get these products to where they're ready to go to market, and then you can come in and acquire them. And it's actually a cheaper cost for the acquiring company than if they would have tried to develop all of this in-house. Let somebody else take the hits on the front end. Why right. I, I just I, I don't understand why the insurance industry isn't more aligned with that thought process because there are there it's pretty hard to find bigger industries that, than pharma from an R and D standpoint. Yet I see this all the time because that's one of the sectors I represent. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right, and you know I know a lot of people in that space, and that's exactly right. And you're seeing M and A in pharma all the time, right? Where you know smaller drug companies or scientists or what have you. Um, so I think, and, and I think there are two things that you said that make uh, a lot of things you said that make a lot of sense. But two things I want to harp on. One is RPA. We've been using robotic process automation since day one. We used it for carriers who don't have APIs, and now we're using it to help agencies create proposals. And now we're helping agencies. So you can see that for us, RPA is a fundamental part from the beginning, just to get you quotes at with carriers who don't have an API. And then now how do we help you create a proposal? How do we help you win the business? And and then ultimately, how do we help you service it? So I think that's fundamental. And when you began your your, your comments, the thing that I thought about was when we started this company, I told all of our investors and I told our, our, I told our team, we're always going to respect the agent because they're the key customer, no matter how big we think the carriers could write a check or whatever. And I tell that to all of our carriers. I love you, want to partner with you, want to work with you, but our customer is the agent. That We have to do them right or it won't work. And ultimately, one of the things I learned about this industry is I think agents have been making bad technology look good for a long time. So I never bought into the idea that agents were actually adverse to technology, right? If it's the opposite, they've had- No, they're adverse to bad technology. technology. Yeah, we've been adverse to bad technology, but forced to use it. Correct, and have used it successfully, despite the fact that it's not efficient, it's not as it makes your life better. And so imagine if you come in and actually give them something that actually works. Yeah, it, it's just it's we're in a in an interesting time in in you know I I feel like probably two or three years ago we were real close to being like Silicon Valley like if you had an insure tech and an idea you you had VCs and angels just throwing right. money throwing money at people that money's dried up so I yep. think that you know they're becoming more judicious in what it is they're going to back and get behind. And I mean, we've even seen this on the acquisition side, agency acquisition slowed down to a certain degree too, because the cherry picking's over. I think the same thing's true with the insure tech, man. And it's no different than being a salesperson. If you're a salesperson, the way that you grow your book and scale is you constantly have to keep pumping new opportunities into the top of your pipeline and work in the process and let the yield be what it is. Insure tech's no different. We need to act on these ideas. We need to collaborate with as many people as we can because we got to keep this snowball going downhill and continuing to build the momentum in the change that's happening in the insurance industry now. But the only way that's going to happen is we keep acting on 
the ideas that we have. So if you're an agent out there listening to this, think about the the three or four things every day that you gripe about. What are the things that stink about your job? What are the problems yeah. that aren't being solved? And then let's figure out a way to to find out how we can solve Absolutely. these problems. That that's it. Like it's not really that complicated. No, it's not. My only ask for that is when you're the that agent to also be patient because it can't be solved in a day. And you have to understand that it is an iterative process, right? The mo much of what you are using, whether it's your AMS or talking to, if we're talking to carriers, they've been around for centuries, some of them, right? And sure tech's been around 10, 15 years. And so the, you know, there's a level of, of patience that it also requires and, and feedback. And one of the things that we do and we try to do incredibly well is we ask for a lot of feedback and we act on it. Every time you use SEMC, it's got to be a better experience for you. Yeah, and I, I mean, that puts you in an awkward position to a certain degree, too, because you have to be careful. You can't be a yes man when that's the case. Absolutely. It, it, because I've seen it. It's an absolute disaster when you've got a company that's taken feedback, which I think everybody should, and I think we should all be willing to give that feedback. It's only going to make it a better experience for everybody. The problem lies in the fact that Companies are under financial pressure to get users, to keep people on their platform. So rather than say no, they string them along and it just makes it even worse. You know, That's right. in, you know, from, from my point of view, if I were in your seat, I'm, I'm going to have to have a firm no, and I'm going to have to know where yeah. I draw the line at all times, because otherwise you end up making a problem 20 times worse by trying to accommodate everybody. Absolutely. No, we are very good at telling what we can't do because we want to be great at what we can do. And that that's that's incredibly important for us. Um, and, and obviously we will continue to evolve, but the evolution starts with a need from the agent and or our carrier partners. And as the hub, exercising it to sort of continue to increase the throughput for the industry generally. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. So we're coming up on almost the top of the hour. What have we missed that you want to make sure we get out there? You know, I think we've covered a lot. So again, I appreciate both the time and, and your great questions. And, and and as always, love listening to what you, even if it's if it's not about SEMSI, I love just listening to your advice and the way your mind works um, because it, it helps me make sure that we stay focused on, on helping the agent as well. And so I think the only thing I would say is, you know, we've got a lot coming in terms of some of the new features and functionality. We've got a heck of a lot more uh, partners in terms of carriers coming and in particular sort of niche players, right? We just added uh, Blitz, like I said, in cannabis, we added cross cover. Uh, we're going to be adding a lot more of these niche players where hard to place business, um, you know, gets there. The only thing I would say that might be a bit of a caveat is we're getting more and more questions around personal lines, and that's something we have tried to stay away from. Um, but it is something that we may have to think about, not your traditional personal lines, but in reality, the niche stuff that's also hard to place. And that's something that, that we are giving some thought. But again, our main focus continues to be, so maybe that's breaking news, but, but in many ways, what's, what we're really focused on is, is commercial. Good deal, man. Well, listen, I'm proud of what you guys have accomplished, man. It's been a it's been a lot. I mean, we met a couple of years ago, and it's amazing just to see how the product is morphed, yeah. and that's certainly a, a reflection of the team that you've put together, and I mean, even more directly, your leadership and your vision for the product as it continues to evolve. So, kudos to you for that, man. And if you're out there and you're not using Semzi right now, what are you doing, man? What are you doing, lady? Come on. Reach out to these guys. You, you know, you're going to be on the outside looking in. And right now we need every tool we can possibly get to give us a leg up on the competition. Everybody's shopping and you don't need to be spinning your wheels. So reach out to Philippe and his team today. How do they get a hold of somebody, man? If they want to do a demo or they just, they're like, you yeah, know what? I'm it's sold. It's I'm sold. I'm ready to roll. It's easy. Info at semc.com. So I N F O at semc, S E M S E E.com. You can even reference this podcast uh, and me and I'll, I'll make it real sweet for you. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, listen, everybody reach out, at least check it out if nothing else, but you're getting ready to roll into that one, one renewal cycle. And I would imagine you want to make that as smooth as possible. And Semzi's here to do that for yeah, you. Yeah, we're, we're here to help. Outstanding. 
All right, we're going to wrap this episode up. Everybody, we will catch you next week. See ya.